Okay, good deal. So I love listening to that lecture because it reminds me a bit of my past emergency medicine and the acute care and uh, taking care of patients' acute pain. And this lecture is going to be dealing with patients' chronic pain. And let me tell you, the load of chronic pain from chronic illness is very significant. I'm sure you've all seen that. It also reminds me these two uh, who just gave a lecture, my daughter and my son-in-law. They're both emergency medicine physicians, been so for about 20 years now. And uh, they don't do lectures together, but I thought it was really nice that the two of you could, could do a lecture together. So kudos. Um, with that said, I called my wife and she says, make sure you remind them it's not just my heart that's been saved. It's the fibromyalgia that I had that was causing me severe pain. And since I transitioned my diet and I exercise every single day, I no longer have problems with fibromyalgia. So uh, I said, okay, I will mention that to them. And we're going to kind of go on to the next slide. Uh, this is me doing a plank. Why am I doing a plank? Because I challenged the first year medical school class. The people who are, I said, bring your buffest, most athletic people. I'm going to challenge you to a plank. And the, the, meth the reason I'm doing this is because I want to prove to you that you can get enough protein, that you can be healthy and strong, and that can happen even at age 75. <laughs> so on, here man. are you the young buffs. First year you students on the ground. I'm up on the table. You can see that. And they're ladies and gentlemen who are challenging me with their classmates cheering them on. And we're going to go to the next section because at after five minutes, most of them had dropped out. After nine minutes, there were two, three left. Uh, after nine and a half minutes, the lady who was on the floor dropped out. I started shaking. My was dripping sweat. But there were two more people left. And I had a mission. This was mind over matter. I didn't care how much it hurt, how bad I felt. I was never going to yield to this young group and prove to them that it's important their lifestyle. So you can see at 11 minutes, the last one dropped out. They were cheering and someone documented the time I said, I'll do another 15 seconds for my plank. Now, had I ever done an 11 minute, 15 second plank before? The answer is no. Uh, I had done in fact, when I started planking about six years ago or seven years ago, my wife challenged me to a plank. I could do about 45 seconds. But because I had a reason for doing the plank, I have been able to build up over time uh, to do this. And I've been challenging the classes uh, along the way. I was eight and a half minutes before this plank. So there are so many diets and so many choices. I'm going to run through this because I really want to do, answer your questions, and I know you have a lot of them. Uh, so I'm going to kind of skip through a lot. The standard American diet, you all know what that is. Um, it's mainly, it's called the meat sweet diet. And, and, you know, that's what the majority of our population is doing. And that's why two thirds of us are overweight. There's the carnivore diet. Whoa, that sounds wonderful. Eat all the meat that you want. And if that makes any sense to you, I don't know how to convince you otherwise. But I do know people who think that eating just meat, even though if you look at our teeth, and they're more like elephants and gorillas than they are like lions and tigers. We don't have those ripping and tearing, meat-eating kind of chompers. And if you look at our intestine, our intestine is long. It's an herbivore intestine. That's the, it's long to digest the nutrients from the plants we eat. Carnivores have shorter intestines because they're able to uh, digest the meat 
uh, much more quickly. So for those of you who say we've always eaten meat, it's part of our diet. Well, let's go back to what our anatomy is really like. Give it a little bit of thought, and maybe you'll come to a similar conclusion that I have that plants are really a healthier choice. There are the gluten-free diet, and for those people with celiac disease, boy, you better avoid wheat and barley and rye because, you know, you're going to be really sick. But that's 1% or less of the population. Uh, and, and so the majority of people will actually gain benefit eating gluten in their diet. There's the paleo, keto, and zone diets, those are all more animal, uh, high protein, low carbohydrate kind of diet choices. And I did the zone diet here for uh, many years. It sounded good to me, 40, 30, 30. I didn't really look at what the science was like connected with it. I didn't think 30% fat was so bad because others were doing 30, 40, and 50% in the American diet. And, but uh, when I found the whole food plant-based, which was 10% fat, uh, according to Esselstyn, I've kind of increased it maybe up to 15% in my diet now. I do eat some avocados, and I do eat some uh, olives, and I do have a quarter cup of nuts a day. Uh, I've transitioned a bit from when we started. Uh, my wife and I back 12 years ago. Um, but these diets, the paleo, the keto, the zone, um, we'll talk about them more if, uh, as you ask questions. Whole food, plant-based is what I'm promoting, not vegan. Vegan is... Actually, I do eat vegan. I only eat plants, but I'm not a junk food vegan. Junk food vegans are eating highly processed foods. They're eating foods with a frying, a lot of frying oil, with a lot of fat calories, which are sort of empty calories. They don't have nutrients, vitamins, and minerals, and other things with all that oil. So be careful uh, about buying products that say vegan on them. Uh, you want Foods is grown in nature. And there are a number of uh, physicians who have promoted this, Ornish and McDougall and Pritikin and, and uh, a whole, uh, uh, Bernard, uh, Clapper. There's a whole list of them. And then uh, we're getting down to intermittent fasting we can talk about. I do that. Uh, my intermittent fasting is not starving. It's eating uh, in a window of time. I wake up and maybe an hour later, I grab a banana and a few prunes, and then I'll eat a breakfast at about eight o'clock or nine o'clock. And then I will eat my last meal by 5.30 or six o'clock. And I try to have a window of about 14 to 16 hours. 16 hour window may promote some longevity benefit. It does in animals. Uh, other animals. Uh, there aren't a lot of human studies yet, but on the principle, it works for me because I don't find myself snacking at nighttime anymore. Um, blood type diet, boy, it sounds good to some people. You know, you have a certain blood type, so you eat certain foods, but there's no science connected with that. And then there's the Gundry diet, which is really popular uh, for some people, saying beans are have too many lectins and they're not healthy for you. But if you, um, you look at the science behind it, it it's non-science. Nonsense, actually, is the bottom line. Um, so again, in the interest of time, I'm going to run through this low carb, keto, paleo, very popular. How many of you have patients who are doing this or potentially feel you should be doing it yourself? Okay, so I get it. There's a lot of celebrity. There's a lot of this is the way to go. Healthiest thing. People lose weight. And you can get some short-term weight loss benefits from, from a keto paleo or a keto diet. It was it came out initially to help children who had seizures that were uncontrolled by the medications that they had. So it worked for them, and someone decided, let's do this for adults. But as you'll see, the long-term consequences may not be something that you feel are advisable. And so let's look at this video on the consequences of 
doing a low carb keto diet. People going on low carb diets may not see a rise in their cholesterol levels. How is that possible? Because weight loss by any means can drop our cholesterol. We could go on an all Twinkie diet and lower our cholesterol if we were unable to eat the dozen daily Twinkies necessary to maintain our weight. That's why a good cocaine habit can lower cholesterol. Chemotherapy can drop cholesterol like a rock. Tuberculosis can work wonders on one's waistline. Anything that drops our weight can drop our cholesterol, but the goal isn't to fit into a skinnier casket. The reason we care about cardiovascular risk factors like cholesterol is because we care about cardiovascular risk, the health of our arteries. Well, now we have studies that have measured the impact of low-carb diets on arteries directly and a review of all the best studies done to date found that low-carb diets impair arterial function, as evidenced by a decrease in flow-mediated dilation, meaning low-carb diets effectively cripple people's arteries. And since the meta-analysis was published, another study found the same thing. Dietary pattern characterized by high protein and fat with low carbohydrate associated with poorer peripheral small artery function, again measuring blood flow into people's limbs. Peripheral circulation is great, but what about circulation in the coronary arteries that feed our heart? There's only been one study ever done measuring actual blood flow to the heart muscles of people eating low-carb diets, and this is it. Dr. Richard Fleming, an accomplished uh, nuclear cardiologist, enrolled 26 people into a comprehensive study of the effects of diet on cardiac function using the latest in nuclear imaging technology, so-called SPECT scans enabling him to actually directly measure the blood flow within the coronary arteries. He then put them all on a healthy vegetarian diet, and a year later the scans were repeated. By that time, however, 10 of the patients had jumped ship onto the low-carb bandwagon. At first, I, I bet he was upset, but surely soon realized he had an unparalleled research opportunity dropped into his lap. Here he had extensive imaging on 10 people following a low-carb diet, and 16 following a healthy high-carb diet. What would their hearts look like at the end of the year? Uh, we can talk about risk factors all we want, but compared to the VEG group, did the coronary heart disease of the patients following the Atkins-like diets improve, worsen, or stay the same? Those sticking to the vegetarian diet showed a reversal of their heart disease as expected. Their partially clogged arteries literally got cleaned out. They had 20% less atherosclerotic plaque in their arteries at the end of the year than at the beginning. What happened to those who abandoned the treatment diet and switched over to the low-carb diet? Their condition significantly worsened. 40 to 50% more artery clogging at the end of the year. Thanks to the kind generosity of Dr. Fleming, we can actually see the changes in blood flow for ourselves. Here are some representative heart scans. The yellow, and particularly red, represent blood flow through the coronary arteries to the heart muscle. This patient went on a plant-based diet, and coronary arteries opened right up, increasing blood flow. This person, however, started out with good flow, but after a year on a low-carb diet, significantly clogged down their arterial blood flow. This is the best science to date, uh, demonstrating the threat of low-carb diets, not just measuring risk factors, but actual blood flow in people's hearts on different diets. Of course, the reason we care about cardiac blood flow is we don't want to die, and a meta-analysis was recently published that finally went ahead and measured the ultimate endpoint, death. And low-carb diets were associated with significantly higher risk of all-cause mortality, meaning low-carbers living a significantly shorter lifespan. So, decreased blood flow after a year, you have weight loss, but you get weight loss with anything you do. You get weight loss with a whole food plant-based diet. You get weight loss with the keto diet. So the question is, is what would you prefer to do for yourself? And what do you think is the best for your patients? We talked about what uh, our anatomy is like and what is really human food. And if you look at around the world, there are the blue zones. They're around the equator where you grow year round. You have fruits and vegetables and whole grains uh, and beans, legumes. Uh, they're very abundant. As you move north and south, you may get weather which may force you at times 
If you can't grow your greens in winter, you may have to nibble on some animal products. But what is actually the healthiest choice? And what is the fuel that works best in our bodies? If you put diesel in a gasoline in engine, it doesn't work so well. So think about the kind of food that you're putting in. And let's talk about what's in the food, micronutrients, uh, macronutrients, and fiber. Uh, the protein. This is an issue. You can't get enough protein. I tried to let you know that you do get enough protein as long as you eat enough calories, you will get enough protein. All protein comes from plants. Animals don't make those amino acids. The plants take the nitrogen out of the air, split the nitrogen um, uh, gas, and form amino acids. The plants make all the amino acids, even the eight that we cannot get ourselves or manufacture, and we will eat the plant. The cow will eat the plant. We don't have to eat protein to get protein. We can eat the amino acids, and we get enough protein. Let's think about mother's milk, the most wholesome food for the human species to allow it to grow. Do you know, anybody have an idea how much protein is in there? Five, five percent. I know that was kind of made me pause also. Why do we are so obsessed with this protein that you have to eat so much? You only need anywhere from five to eight to 10%. And you'll get that if you're eating a variety of whole plant foods. Too much protein, which we get in the meat sweet standard American diet leads to Stress on the kidneys, not a very healthy way to go. So take this point. You get enough protein if you're eating enough food. Let's go to carbohydrates. That seems to be the enemy. When we ask people about who have diabetes, what is the problem? And they'll say carbohydrates. Well, they don't really understand the difference between simple and complex carbohydrates. So they translate this into, I shouldn't eat fruit. I shouldn't eat potatoes. I shouldn't eat these foods that are grown in nature because they have sugar in them. Yeah? In fact, you may even be a little bit confused because these are the messages we give to, to our patients and the myths that we have been living under. We all know that fruits and vegetables are healthy. Yes? There isn't any one of us that would say we shouldn't be eating more fruits and vegetables unless you bought into this idea that carbohydrates in any form are your enemy. And so... The complex carbohydrates are the ones that we want to be eating. We want to be eating the sugar that has the fiber and the other nutrients with it. If we stick with eating that, we can tell our diabetic patients, if you avoid the animal products, which are causing inflammation and causing your di diabetes to worsen, and how does that happen? Well, it happens like this. You eat a meal and you have protein, fat, and sugar floating around in your bloodstream. And the body says, we need insulin to get the sugar in the cell so we can burn our favored source of energy. So insulin is kicked out and it goes over to the cell and it tries to open up this cell. And, and if you are normal, don't have diabetes or insulin resistance, the cell opens up, the sugar goes in, your blood sugar goes down and all is well. But what happens if the cell has a lot of energy already inside of it, too much fat. When the insulin comes over and says, open sesame, the cell says, no, I have enough energy. It's the fat in our diet that leads to the 
inability to control diabetes that leads us to write for another pill, which we'll never control as long as our patients are continuing to eat too much fat. And where are they getting the fat? If they're not eating carbohydrates, they're not eating plants. They're eating fat and protein. So we, they think carbohydrates are the enemy. We are leading them into a lifetime of diabetes and complications. When you learn about that, when I learned about it, I was like, wow, what, how could this be? And then I started telling my patients about this and they started getting off of their diabetic medications. It's just totally amazing. I don't know how more excited I can get about this or how much more I could try to convince you of how important fiber is uh, and, and eating foods that have fiber. We're going to get to that next. But complex carbohydrates are found in most all plants in varying degrees. And again, that fiber um, will keep you from developing those uh, large spikes. Now, when you do refining or processing of those sugars, high fructose corn syrups and, and the refined the white sugars and even the white flours, that becomes inflammatory. It causes a rise in insulin. And, in you know, it just is not the healthy choice. Okay, let's get on to fats. Fats in the diet. We talked briefly about uh, when you're just eating strictly plants, you get about 10 to 15 percent whole, uh, um, 10 to 15 percent fat. But in the United States diet, it's about 30 to 50 percent. There's nine calories a gram. A gram is about less than a thimble. It's pretty calorie dense compared to protein and carbohydrate, which are four. So if you want to lose weight, you want to have less fat in your diet. Well, we talk about good fats and some people say bad fats. The bad fats would be the saturated and trans fats. The saturated is what's building up the plaque inside your arteries. And you don't really want saturated fats and they are contained in the meat, butter, cheese, that you're eating, the animal products, and one plant product, coconut. Coconut, coconut milk has a high amount of saturated fat. Be careful if you're eating that. Um, and let's go on to the next, fiber. This is such an important topic. The average American gets 14 to 15 grams of fiber. Our country recommends 25 to 35 grams, but the countries that are really healthy are 60 to 100. I told you that's what I eat. How do I get that? If you've downloaded Gregor's Daily Dozen app on your phone, you can look and see what I eat. I eat three servings of legumes every day. How much is fiber is in a serving of beans or lentils? A half a cup is a serving seven grams about, okay? So I eat three of those a day. That's 21 grams of fiber from just beans or lentils. I eat three servings of whole grains. What are my whole grains? I eat oatmeal or groats. Uh, groats is the form before you cut it up. If steel cut oats are like groats that are cut with a blade. Um, if you're eating steel coat oats or regular oats, that's fine. It's healthy. You get a little more fiber from eating the steel cut or the groat. Three servings of those. Uh, let's say I eat two in the morning along with a serving of rice or quinoa, some other serving, a half a cup of some other whole grain. And there are about four grams of fiber in each of those. So that's 12 on the 21 is 33. Okay, so far I eat four to five serving of fruit every day. And each serving of fruit is about three. So add another 12 onto that or to 15. We're getting up to into the mid forties already. And then I eat five servings of vegetables and about four grams of fiber in each serving of vegetable. It's a lot of food, uh, but I'm full all the day and I get oh, between 60 and 80. I also eat a quarter cup of nuts, a tablespoon of uh, ground flaxseed, a uh, quarter teaspoon of turmeric. It's all on Gregor's Daily Dozen. And I do um, B12 uh, 
I'm over 65, so 1,000 micrograms a day. Uh, for those younger than 65, um, the supplement would be once a week, 2,000 micrograms once a week. Okay, fiber. Plants, only plants have fiber. Every time you eat an animal product, you're not a bad person. You're just not giving yourself your best health benefit. What health benefit are you getting for every 10 grams of fiber you add to your diet? You're reducing your heart attack risk by 10%. Why? Because the fiber hooks up with cholesterol and, and it reduces, the it wheelbarrows it out. So it doesn't keep recirculating around and get deposited in your coronary arteries leading to atherosclerosis. How about breast cancer? Ten per, uh, an eight percent reduction in breast cancer risk. Why is that? Because when estrogen gets dumped into the intestinal tract, it hooks up with this fiber and it gets wheelbarrowed out, so you don't have excess estrogen hitting on you. So you get re reduced reduction in breast cancer risk. And let's talk about colon cancer. For every 10 grams of fiber, you decrease your colon cancer risk by 10%. Why is that? Because that extra fiber in bulk speeds your intestinal waste faster out your colon. So whatever toxins you have, they're not laying against your colon wall, creating a tumor. If you can't, People who do whole food plant-based, they have larger bowel movements. I have a larger bowel movement. It's softer. It's not like little rabbit pellets. Dr. Perquette found, he made a, an interesting discovery when he went to Africa, I think it was. He was from England. He says, you know, in England, we have small rabbit pellet uh, stools. Uh, they're hard, they're constipated. And we have big hospitals. But here in Africa, they have these big stools and they have these little tiny hospitals. When you think about it in that way, you start saying, maybe that extra fiber might be worth trying. Let's talk a little bit more about fiber. It's these three areas, butyrate, serotonin, TMAO. You got to know about this. The, <laughs> the butyrate is a chemical produced by your microbiome. Uh, there are certain bacteria that tend to produce more chemicals that are really healthy for you, like the serotonin and butyrate. If you're eating meat, dairy, and eggs, you're populating your, your colon your microbiome with bacteria that are called bacteroides. These bacteroides, they produce this chemical called trimethylamine. That's an inflammatory chemical which causes the LDL cholesterol to get deposited in your arteries. If you're eating a plant-based diet, you're promoting the growth of Travatella in your gut. And they don't produce trimethylamine. You have a much lower level of inflammation in your body. So you say, so what are is the food? How do we feed and promote the growth of these good bacteria? Well, it's plant food. It's fiber. So if you're starving your good bacteria by eating the 14 grams of fiber, because you're eating all animal products throughout the day, pretty much, you're not giving yourself an anti-inflammatory diet and giving your best chance for health. Let's talk about supplements. Helpful, harmful. We talked about vitamin B briefly. Vitamin D, uh, most of us don't get enough sun in Oregon and in Idaho, so I take 2,000 international units a day. Um, all, most all other supplements, they're not regulated. You don't know what you're getting. Yes, it's unregulated. They can have what they say in the bottle or they may not have what's said in the bottle. There can be some toxins in these supplements. What about, well, vitamin C is great or vitamin E is great. Supplements are sort of like this. 
You listen to a symphony, a Mozart symphony. It's beautiful. And then you say, let's take the flutes, put them over on another stage, and bring in a hundred more flutes. Now let's play the symphony. Sound the same? Work the same? No, it doesn't. So here was the whole food that was like playing the Mozart symphony. It works well with all these different plant nutrients and chemicals that were have been developed throughout eternity into our food. And we're now making it into a supplement, which doesn't work as well. So think about that. It's not enough to just eat vegan. Junk foods do not promote health. I say, I, I have this read the label. What's wrong with that? <laughs> If you're buying whole plant foods, you don't have to buy many foods with labels. When you buy fruit and vegetables, are they having labels on them? When you go to the whole grains, do they have labels on them? Not very often. You know, maybe there's a label for the price. Um, and same way with beans. If you're buying canned beans, they'll have a label on it. It's okay. If you do, I'd encourage you to buy the no salt beans for the vast majority of you. And if you buy salted beans, just rinse them a couple times for your patients who can't afford the no salt beans. If you're looking for health, you eat mostly unprocessed plants, eat little animal foods, and there are barriers to making these changes. I understand the barriers. You understand them probably too. And the way to get over these barriers is through education, uh, setting an example, modeling for others, having group support. We give free classes every single week. We counsel people for free uh, every single week. Uh, if you have patients who are having trouble, uh, you have to have some place that you can trust. I know we have a, you know, people don't believe that things are free these days, but if you want, you can get in touch with me and we'll hook up whoever needs help. Uh, there are cultural influences. People start doing this. They go home and their relatives tell them, oh, you know, you won't get enough protein. You're losing too much weight. You look too skinny. Well, if you look at the photographs from the 1940s and 50s in our country, that's what a normal people look like. And now you look at people and, you know, if they're looking like that, they're too skinny. We're bombarded with food pornography messages. And I must say, I'm like Pavlov's dog. I see the dripping cheese on the commercial on the burger. My mouth waters like the Pavlov's dog, but the word that comes into my brain, poison. I do not pollute the lakes and streams when I go out in wilderness. I'm not doing that to my body. I understand the science. Animal products, I don't need them. They are not health foods. I'm done with them. Uh, eating out is very difficult. Uh, it's hard to go out with a restaurant. If I go out with friends to a restaurant, I usually eat something before or I find a restaurant that actually will serve me my food. And there are more and more that are coming about as the years tick by. There are many myths we live by. You can't get enough protein unless you're eating uh, animal products. That's a total myth. Milk does a body good. The more milk that uh, people drink in other societies, they have higher risk of hip fractures, not lower. That's a statistic that you will find as you read through the science. The genes are not your destiny. You are born with genes, about 20% of your health, but the genes can be turned on and off. That's epigenetics, which you've heard about. You have a gun, you load the bullet. No one gets injured until what? The trigger gets pulled. So you have the genes that are like the bullets in your gun, they don't produce the diabetes or heart trouble or kidney issues unless what? You pull the trigger, what's that? You eat the foods that cause the inflammation which pull the trigger. 
You don't need animal products for good health. It costs more to eat healthy. It's a myth. Uh, beans, rice, lentils, quinoa, much less expensive than meat, dairy, and eggs. And most of the people I help can cha transition their diets say, my food bill is actually less. Calcium supplements, which you're using for your patients with osteoporosis, you'll have less osteoporosis with a plant-based diet. And those calcium supplements, if you look at the science, you will see that there's a higher risk of stroke and heart attack because when you take a supplement of calcium, it makes the blood a little thicker and, and, and so you can have some clotting that you wouldn't normally have. Supplements, it's best to get your calcium from the greens and the beans in your life. Do you need to drink cow's milk? Uh, where we ever got that concept, I don't know. You can call it tradition, uh, but there are certain problems. I told you about, uh, there's a problem with bony fractures, but in all dairy, there's IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor one hormone. It causes the, stimulates the growth of a little mammal to a bigger. It also stimulates the growth of a cancer. Why would you want to eat milk and cheese and dairy products to promote a cancer that may be lurking inside your body? It doesn't make sense to me. Three-fourths of the world population has lactase deficiency, so they get belly aches. So they come in and they get prescribed protonics or some uh, proton pump inhibitor for their bellyache, and then they have a side effect to that. It just is a continuing cycle that can be fixed by avoiding any kind of uh, cow's milk or mammal milk. Do a plant milk if you have to have milk in your life. Plant-based nutrition changes everything. I'm not going to go over every one of those because I want to have time for questions. Why I'm plant-based, it's for my personal health. It's for the world's health. Why the world health? When we use raise animals for our food source, we cut the trees down like in the Amazon. We, we um, <laughs> the, the animals that we're raising produce methane gas, which creates more global warming than all of our transportation. There are so many uh, problems connected with using animals. And, and we've depleted 90% of the fish in our world's oceans already. Uh, we can eat fish for a few more years, but our grand great-grandchildren, if they're still around, uh, they're not going to be eating much fish. Um, and for the animal's sake, you know, most animals, they don't like to be raised in concentration camps, which is 98% of when you go to the market, what you're buying. So uh, climate change, I'm going to go over this because I want to make sure. I just want to share these with you. There's some really good environmental videos uh, that you may want to take a, a look at uh, for the animals. Um there's some ancient wisdom. I want to share some of my food with you because I want to share how joyful the eating is, how tasty it is. Because if you don't like this, you're not going to do it and your patients aren't going to do it. I love what I'm eating and I want to share this with you. This is my a part of my breakfast. This is groats or oatmeal and it's a big bowl. It's a full cup with the water that it's it's um, heated up in. So I like mine usually plain, uh, sometimes with a few nuts and seeds. My wife likes hers with fruit, a little more savory. Uh, you can choose and there's a little plant milk in there, but that's only half of our breakfast. There's much more to come. Uh, let's see, this isn't quite... Okay, here's our breakfast, the first half of our breakfast. So what do you see here that you're not personally eating? You're personally probably not eating broccoli for breakfast. I know that was weird for me at first, but I love it and I miss it if I don't get it. I missed it today, but that's okay. I got some last night, arugula. Uh, there, my, 
I like eating spinach and arugula, and then I grow my own sprouts. Like uh, either it's so easy to do. You put some seeds in a jar, and once or twice, twice a day, you rinse them. Takes. 15 seconds to half a minute to rinse the seeds in the morning and the evening. And within five days, I get these fresh uh, broccoli sprouts or radish sprouts that we eat over the next number of days. My wife makes the beans, but any beans are great. You notice here, they're on top of steamed greens, which is a full cup. She makes two cups a piece. That's kale or chard or uh, collard greens. And then here's a mushroom. Uh, you get a aromatase inhibitor, the only food that has that in it. Uh, so she steams that up. Uh, she added a few little pumpkin seeds here, it looks like. Uh, we had, uh, we have in here radish and uh, maybe pepper, um, a little clove of garlic that's chopped up fresh, uh, some more uh, greens. So we have like maybe three handfuls of greens for breakfast. We started with one leaf of romaine lettuce. Then we went to a leaf of kale. Then we went to a leaf of collard. And then we added a kale and a chard. It took several months for us to get to this point, but we are stuffed by the time we eat this. Uh, we also eat orange and we eat a half to three quarters of a cup of blueberries every day because of the antioxidants. Now, there are other foods that you can eat later on in the day. Uh, like these, uh, you could eat them in the morning if you wanted, but this is a, a fun plate of uh, sweet potatoes, which are roasted uh, with some veggies. Notice the colors on these. I'm going to just flip through here pretty quickly. How colorful, it's very tasty foods. It's not just salad that we're eating. We get lots of potatoes and legumes. There's tofu, there's rice. Uh, my wife makes a killer tofu. Uh, she uh, cuts up the tofu, which is nothing more than um, uh, edamame or soybeans, which are mashed together. It sounds bad. It, it tastes, doesn't have a lot of taste, but when you add a little coconut aminos, with a little nutritional yeast. It's not really uh, going to give you a yeast infection. Uh, you add that together with uh, other spice, uh, and it just puts it through the air fryer, and it, my mouth is watering talking about it. There are beets, and there are other vegetables, and there are chowders. Um, uh, here's a frittata which is uh, tofu with mixed vegetables. Uh, there's edamame beans and other kind of stir fry vegetables. We even eat pizza without cheese and it tastes wonderful, believe it or not. Yes. I'll share all that with you. There are many sites and uh, there are no cost sites actually. Um, Here's, I've been growing, this is how you grow sprouts at home. These are sunflower sprouts, which are harder to grow. And even my dog, when she was alive, knew the benefits of eating a plant-based diet. These are broccoli uh, stems and what else? Uh, pepper. And... I could go over some more foods, but I'm not going to do that. Because why? I want to answer your questions. And that's more important because there must be someone who's saying, but there's a problem. You know, what about caffeine? Someone asked me that. Caffeine, coffee uh, or caffeine. If you don't have problems with anxiety or something, a cup or two a day is probably okay. Alcohol, I mentioned before, there is risk for breast cancer. If you want to take that risk, and, and it really is giving you that much benefit to drink, it's your, your choice. But if you're worried about that, you may want to say, I'll find a different solution here, like maybe green tea or an herbal tea. First question online is thoughts on non-commercial meat and dairy, example, wild game, raw dairy, farm, and local honey. What was that first? 
Thoughts on non-commercial meat and dairy, example, wild game, raw dairy, farm eggs, and local honey. Okay, let's talk about that. Anybody have the answer of the difference between a grass-fed cow and a, a regular commercial-fed cow? What about the fiber difference in them? That's my answer. No fiber. You can eat it. It's healthier, but it still has a lot of fat, and it's got a lot of animal protein, which you would find is inflammatory over time. I know it's hard for you to believe that now. I can't convince you of that. I encourage you to go to nutritionfacts.org, listen to the videos, look at, he, he lists every one of the articles he uses, so it's completely transparent. So you can look it up yourself and say, what's he saying here? I don't believe it. I want to see the article. They're all listed right there on that site, Nutrition Facts. Org. I've been doing it for years, and I would encourage you to do it. Yes. My thoughts, uh, Doctor. Uh, I have some patients who grow grass-fed meat, and they still eat them corn in the last week, right before butchering, because they bring them in from the field. You have to weigh them and get them ready, so that still makes it pro-inflammatory. I don't. There's very few that would change that and he and the guy I talked to was like, I don't know if I would do that. I'd have to get a special feed with the password. Yeah. So it none of us like to see our neighbors suffer and lose their business. But the reality is if you saw the video earlier on, you can help patients, subsidize them, help them transition from dairy to berries. You can have them transition to a different crop, but it'll take our culture to help them make that transition. And overall, it'll reduce our health care costs and it will be a benefit to us. They don't, the farmers won't have to starve if we help them out. Okay, a couple of questions. You can comment on home processing of foods. So like an example would be like hummus, for example, uh, store bought versus like a home process. And then the second thing is uh, time is a challenge for a lot of people. So if you could comment on like what your prep times are uh, in preparation for breakfast, lunch, dinner, or what about homemade things like hummus? Excellent decision, a excellent thing to do. If you have a blender, you can take beans, uh, garbanzo beans or any kind of beans uh, that you want or lentils and you can spin them up with some um, uh, garlic and onion and pepper perhaps or whatever you like and any spice and you can leave out the tahini. The tahini is the fat associated with it. And when you buy it commercially, there are different percentages of tahini. So different percentages of fat, anywhere from about 2 to 13%. So if you have someone who wants to lose weight, making their own hummus would be an excellent choice. Uh, it takes a little time to do that. Uh, but, you know, it just depends on the lifestyle. As far as fast meals, for me, if I were living by myself, which I'm not, fortunately, uh, my go-to would be potatoes. I would live on potatoes, Idaho or otherwise. Um, I would, I, I'd say that's the center of my diet. I'm going to microwave that thing every night for breakfast or for lunch. I'm going to uh, cut it open. It didn't take much to do that. Microwave, cut open. Then I would take my uh, beans, a half a can of beans, and I'd put it in there. Then I might take a little salsa or I might use hummus with the beans or by itself. Use a little salsa, grab a couple handfuls of any kind of green make a variety of greens throughout the week, but just grab a handful out of those packages that are pre-washed, not much cooking there. And then if one potato wasn't enough, I would grab another one and I would fill myself up. Uh, and then I'd, for dessert, I'd have a piece of fruit or two, apple, banana, orange, whatever it might be. Not much cooking. Yeah. Breakfast. Okay. Oatmeal, heat it up in the water, Put a plant milk on it, grab a few nuts, uh, have a half a bowl of uh, blueberries or a half a cup of uh, blueberries with that. And um, this is not hard, but it, it sounds like it's hard. 
But when you start doing it, at first it's like learning to swing a tennis racket or, or swing a golf club. It's really awkward at first. And you think, boy, I don't know if I can do that. And then after you keep practicing, pretty soon it's like, it's easy. Nothing to it. That's my answer. On the what? Okay. Meat replacement products. They're processed foods. They add salt, sugar, fat. Not healthy products. Great for transitioning. Great for that spouse or a significant other who says, there ain't no way I'm doing this. And then you slip in one of those uh, artificial <laughs> fancy burgers and they say oh this was pretty good and you tend tell them well that wasn't real meat you know it was plant-based and they say oh well maybe this isn't so bad but it's not healthy long term okay yes comment on glycemic index that not all fruits and vegetables are yeah, so some glycemic index, some fruits get, uh, and vegetables, you have higher rise in your blood sugar. And for some people who are having trouble controlling their diabetes, it might be better to eat lower glycemic. Lower glycemic potatoes would be sweet potatoes as opposed to white potatoes. But I must tell you that for those patients, I tell them to stop eating any animal products and get rid of the oils. They don't have any problem with having to deal with the glycemic in index. The most majority can ignore it. What else? Yes. Do I ever just what? Yeah. So do I ever just want a handful of uh, sour cream and or bacon or whatever it might be? You know, I look at it, my mouth waters. And I say, that's poison. So I, I just cut it off. I, I've trained myself to say, it's just not my food. And why torture myself? Now, with chocolate, that's a little different. What do I do with chocolate? I learned this technique when I first started transitioning. Before, I used to have a chocolate bar, and I would, you know, grab the chocolate bar, and I'd be watching TV, or I'd be on the phone with somebody, and I'd eat this, and then I'd get done with the chocolate bar. I'd look at my hand, and I'd say, where's the chocolate? No thought at all, no mindfulness. When I started doing this, when I wanted chocolate, I'd take a square of chocolate. I go sit in a room. I would put my phone out of the room. I would take this chocolate and I would just savor it. Man, that tastes good. And I was satisfied. So if you have foods that you have to have, just be mindful. Use them as a little garnish or a treat. You don't have to deprive yourself of everything that you think is so important. If you have to keep eating meat, keep eating your meat, but you know, cut the size down a lot less than what you would and use it as a garnish and focus your attention when you're eating it. Oh, I like the flavor. This is good. I know it's probably not the healthiest for me, but if you're taking pills or you want to reverse your heart disease or your diabetes, I wouldn't recommend doing that. You're torturing yourself. I would recommend you do whole bore, full out for at least two years to unclog your arteries. Yes. Is organic a scam or a legitimate concern? A what? Is organic a scam or a legitimate concern? Organic is a legitimate concern. It's the healthiest way to go, but it it's not an absolute necessity. If you're uh, if you're not if you're eating non-organic, um, you may have like ten extra people who uh, develop cancer because of the the chemicals involved. But you're gonna have if you're eating those vegetables and fruits, you're gonna have like twenty thousand people who are saved. If you're eating organic, you won't have those. 10 or 20 people that develop the cancer. So there is some benefit by eating organic. And that's what I tend to promote. That's what I try to eat, except bananas and oranges that I can peel off. I don't make a deal. There are a lot of questions, but go ahead. Where do you get your 
quick comment on plant-based milk replacement. You know, yeah. do you have a favor of things that are better than others? I favor soy because Gregor favors soy. It has a bit more uh, the protein in it, um, but you don't want too much of it. Almond milk is what I started with for my first six, eight years. My wife likes oat mil milk. You don't have to have any milk, but any of those are fine. Whatever your taste. And they come in vanilla and plain usually. And you just find what you like. We have a question. Yes. So to address one of the questions about quick things, and I want to know what you think about freeze drying. But we have neighbors that are working people who eat a lot of these healthy dishes or stews or soups, and they freeze fry them, and then they can just add hot water to it, and they have a savory whatever in, in minutes. So my question is, um, a suggestion, but the other question is, is the nutritional value as good refried, or I mean, uh, freeze dry it? <laughs> Yeah, so freeze-dried is great. In fact, there, there may be more nutritional value than having the uh, vegetables sit on the counter. Uh, they may lose some uh, antioxidant effects. So frozen is really a healthy way to go. And uh, let's see, what was the other part? I have a suggestion because someone was asking, how do you do it in a busy life? Yeah. Well, you make your stews and you... Um, uh, I'm sorry. That's all right. There's also benefit in, in uh, if you cook a potato, if you put it in the refrigerator, it develops more resistant starch, which is more food for your good bacteria in your microbiome. So there's an advantage to freezing your potato salad. Yes. Yeah, so we try not to use any oil. If we you have a pan that sticks, my wife wipes it out with a uh, paper towel. Oil is like uh, white sugar. It has calories, about 120 calories for two tablespoons, where sugar has about 50. Uh, neither one has vitamins or minerals or any other nutrients other than the oil is pure fat. It has no fiber. And, and, and like olive oil is 14% uh, saturated fat. So you don't really want that. But if you look at the Mediterranean diet, which is a compromise from the healthiest diet to what we think people will eat, they advise people to use olive oil. The benefits of the Mediterranean diet are the fruit and the vegetable ingestion. It's not the oil. Man, that was fun. I just have one announcement I would need to make. Uh, I need a ride back. I have two people who have offered. If there's someone who's by themselves, the people who offered, they've been listening to me, uh, you know, like I'm driving them crazy, I think. So if there's someone who's willing to uh, drive me back to the airport, I'd love to go with you and it, it, just come up and see me. Otherwise, my other two options are, are going to, I guess, put up with me. I really enjoyed spending the time with you. Thank you for listening.